Welcome to the ANU Energy Update 2020. Uh, we are happy to be co-hosting uh, Energy Update uh, with the Energy Research Institute's Council for Australia, otherwise known as ERICA, this year uh, for our event uh, that uh, we at the ANU Energy Change Institute are usually the host for. So welcome to all our colleagues uh, in uh, ERICA institutes around the country. Today, we're going to take a close look at the International Energy Agency's World Energy Outlook 2020, or as it's otherwise known, the WIO. And uh, my name is Professor Ken Baldwin, and I'm Director of the ANU Energy Change Institute. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands upon which we meet and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So please note uh, today that uh, this is a public forum and that uh, media are present. Uh, I'll outline uh, the proceedings uh, in a minute, uh, but uh, in the meantime, uh, I'd encourage you to uh, uh, be familiar with the, um, the uh, Q&A button on the screen and think about questions that you might want to ask during the question and answer session uh, later in the presentation. Uh, you can use the Q&A session to either include your name or to ask questions anonym uh, anonymously. And we'll try and get through as many of these questions as we can today, but if uh, there are some that we can't answer immediately, uh, then we'll do our best to uh, try and answer them via email. Uh, if you want, uh, you can always email us at energy.change at anu.edu.au. And uh, we'll do our best to follow all those questions up. Okay, so it uh, looks like uh, we've got uh, a fair few people joining. So uh, I'd like to now uh, officially uh, get things underway by introducing our speaker, uh, Ian Cronshaw. Uh, Ian is well known to uh, many of us uh, who've uh, participated in Energy Update over the years. Uh, Ian uh, is, uh, of course, a contributor to uh, 13 WIOs, World Energy Outlook reports for the IEA, uh, and uh, is uh, of course a, a very uh, experienced uh, commentator in this area with an enormous body of knowledge. Uh, once again this year, Ian has uh, volunteered to uh, walk us through the World Energy Outlook for the year and uh, to give uh, some insights into some of the thinking uh, behind the uh, expert uh, analysis that is already presented uh, in the WIO. Uh, later, after Ian's presentation, uh, we have a panel of experts from uh, industry and academia, uh, who I'll introduce after Ian speaks. Uh, but for the present, uh, I'd now like to uh, welcome Ian to present the World Energy Outlook 2020. Over to you, Ian. Thanks, Ken. Um just starting with the official disclaimer, of course, I'm no longer uh, have an official relationship with the IEA, but uh, I was there for the uh, best part of 15 years, and uh, I'm pretty certain I've got a, a reasonable idea what the thinking is behind the WIA. Just while we're loading up the presentation, um, the time frame for the WIA, as is, as is normal, is around about 20 years ahead um, to 2040. But this year, I guess for obvious reasons, we've um, so this year, for obvious reasons, we've got a much stronger focus on 2030. I'll explain that in due course. Uh, the second caveat is, of course, that at some point when you're drafting a report like this, you do have to draw the line on new information. And that line uh, was drawn in early to mid-August. And that's really quite an important point um, for our collection of reasons, which I'll go into it along the way. And just a final point, of course, and I make this point every time I speak about the WIA, is that these, these are not forecasts, these are projections. Um, based on policies, and as such, they are not rooted um, in certainty. Uh, au contraire, they are designed to inform policy makers and, if you like, to assess policy adequacy. Um, those of you who have uh, been a few of my talks know I always like to start off with a little quiz just to keep people uh, in the flow a bit. Um, all these questions uh, will be answered at the end of proceedings, or end of my proceeding anyway. Um, they all do have serious implications. 
So first of all, in the best traditions of recycling, um, I just thought when we look back over the last decade, the power sector, of course, was the biggest contributor to increased global greenhouse gas emissions. But the number two contributor was, and I've given you five choices there. So I'll be interested, um, people can enter their choices there. Um, we'll get, like I said, we'll give the answers at the end of proceedings. I'll give just people five seconds to work their way through the choices. Uh, aviation, heavy trucks, SUV, of course, sport utility vehicles, Australians hopefully familiar with that acronym. So, yep, okay. So the second question, I'll just clock on here, sorry. Okay. So the second question is a bit more interesting. Just a little thought experiment. If tomorrow all new energy using equipment was to use zero emissions technology, all electricity to be decarbonised, um, all cars to be decarbonised, where would we get in the longer term in terms of climate stabilisation? I'm giving you four alternatives here. Stabilisation at current levels, increase 1.3, increase 1.5, increase 1.7. Um, I guess in Australia, of course, we're, uh, we're already up in the, we're told in the 1.4 degree margin, but this is a, a global number. So again, I'll be interested to see what people are already getting some real polling. That's a very interesting real polling. We showed this polling at the end just for proceedings. So question three. Question three is about investment. If we stopped investment in oil production tomorrow, then over the next 20 years, where would oil output be? Again, five alternatives, slightly below today's levels, 80% of today's levels, half of today's, about 20% of today, the that's one of my economist colleagues said, well, output will respond to demand. Uh, good economist answer, I suppose. And the final question, we have a very interesting spread of questions already. And the final question, Australia, electricity provides what percentage of total final energy use? I think four alternatives, 15, 20, 40 percent and a half. And the final point, which is, I guess the physicist in me saying, well, Comparing electricity with coal or oil is like comparing apples to artichokes and it's not a fair comparison, um, but we'll come back to that. So, I'll just give people a, a moment or two more to vote and we'll get the results at the end, is that the plan? Okay, I can see them in real time. Okay. Just let me know when it's finished. Okay, this is an educated audience too. Okay, I'm gonna, I think I'll spare people the, the results because it's, it's just more for your interest, but there are some serious points. So I'll move on to the presentation now if I can. Okay, so obviously without using the word unprecedented, too often um, COVID-19 has made 2020 a very interesting year. So we have two key questions that the WIO attempts to, to answer. Firstly, how does the pandemic and its aftermath reshape the energy sector as it's reshaping our economies? And secondly, how will this play out as countries individually and collectively um, respond to COVID and to the competing or maybe not competing, maybe complementary need for rapid energy transition? So as I said, we're looking at more heavily in the next 10 years and of course two key uncertainties the duration and severity of the pandemic. Prime Minister this morning um, seems pretty comfortable. Australia's in a reasonably good place, but there are plenty of other countries who aren't. Um, we look at China and the China's, China's economy. You only have to look at the iron ore price to see that China um, is recovering relatively quickly, both economically and many other ways. So the recovery is likely to be uneven. And of course, you know, even now, um, its duration and severity remain quite unknown. And secondly, how will energy policy makers respond to that recovery? Um, these, these are scenarios and as such that they are an artificial construct built heavily around the idea of policies. They are not uh, forecasts as such, they are projections and have to be seen in that regard. Hopefully I don't have to labour that point. And finally, right at the end of the presentation, hopefully I've got enough time to give a reasonable discussion of net zero 
um, emissions, how that might happen, how quickly that might happen, and what's happening globally. And of course, as I said, the, these projections date from August. Um, quite a few things have happened since then. So um, four scenarios are in the book. The first we call STEPS, and I'll use these acronyms right, right throughout, so please pay attention here. STEPS is stated policies, ones that have been backed up with sound implementation measures, not simply um, announcements. In this, in this scenario, the global economy recovers relatively quickly. Energy demand recovers um, by early 2023. I uh, wouldn't quite call it a V-shaped recovery, but it's relatively quick. But of course, the 2040 economy is still quite a bit smaller than that projected last year. Um, emissions in this scenario lead to long-term temperature increase of 2.7 to, to 3 degrees. DRS, our delayed recovery scenario, in which case the damage to the global economy is more severe, the recovery is slower, and what that means for investment, energy security, and, and the environment. Sustainable development scenario, a relatively artificial construct in which we, we the IEA, um, essentially get greenhouse gas emissions to fall to zero by 2070. And that brings about a well, 50% probability of a 1.65 degree temperature increase. And the way that that happens, um, you can see by 2030, already power sector emissions have fallen, um, dramatically so. Electric cars are now 40% of new car sales. And indeed, 2019 would be a peak year for fossil fuel use, 2019 that is. Um, we would have already seen peak oil. And finally, the net zero emissions. And this is designed to produce zero emissions by within the next 30 years a 50% chance of keeping global warming to 1.5 degrees. Um, the true, both, both SDS and NetZ50 are um, essentially compatible with Paris, but of course, obviously, um, falling emissions in, in that time frame much more ambitious. As you see there, um, the countries that have committed are essentially talking about a 50% fall over the next decade in emissions. But I'll discuss all of those four scenarios in a fair bit more detail. So looking at what happened in 2019 to 2020, you can see globally, um, obviously fossil fuels hit very hard, oil um, transport demand hit very hard. We saw oil demand in the month of April fall, something like 27 million barrels a day. And that is something I've never seen, um, and any of us have ever seen, I don't think in our professional careers, and of course with interesting price impacts. Um, gas, a fair bit less so. Coal, quite a lot, 7% um, fall. Um, greenhouse gas emissions, as you can see, they're falling about 7%. Some countries had quite a bit higher. Um, the US was down, well, it was, is projected to be down about 10% in terms of emissions, and that's on the basis of a fall in coal, coal-based emissions by nearly 20%. And indeed, you can see almost everywhere, coal was the fuel that took the biggest hit in terms of electricity demand, while renewables actually went up. And indeed, renewable installation has continued very steadily throughout throughout uh, 2020 and indeed is projected to continue um, quite strongly. Energy investment, of course, took a very quick and dramatic tumble. And if I get time, I can talk about what that means in Australian terms, but certainly the global sense, the speed of that downturn um, in oil and gas investment in particular, but also coal and other sources with a notable exception of renewable electricity has been quite dramatic. Electric cars held up pretty well through uh, 2020 as well. Electricity, one of the interesting things about electricity is that right through um, the last decade, we've seen electricity increase its share um, as a uh, share of total energy. And indeed, when we see what happened in 2020, electricity fell only 2%. And indeed, in China actually went up. And again, as I said, you've only got to look at that electricity number and the price of iron ore to tell you that the Chinese economy is, is back and is, is back growing again. So you can see there, okay, 2019 was starting to come off trend, but we anticipate one of the key um, key outcomes in all our projections are the increase in share of electricity. Price impacts were pretty impressive. Um, can I, I can wiggle this around. So um, oil, as I said, 27 million barrels a day and a volatile, this is in dollars per million BTU over here, so the scales are normalized to energy content. Um, you can see this dramatic fall, and of course, in the case of um, West Texas, 
Uh, you can see the fall in that red line. West Texas um, actually went negative. Um, that's a composite oil price. That's right. I just keep talking. Um, so the price of oil is the most dramatic outcome. Obviously, it's recovered to some extent um, around the $50 mark uh, as we speak today. Um, prices of other fuels. Gas is an interesting one. Um, and you, over on the, the left, over on the right hand side, you, you've got three different gas prices, and they all show rather, rather different, rather marching to a rather different beat. Um, price of gas in, in the United States, down in the two dollar range per million BTU. Um, but it's interesting that dotted purple line up top is the um, is the gas price, is the contract gas price. And that contract gas price is what accounts for about 70% of the gas sold in Europe. So having spent the last year in Australia, I've heard a fair bit of discussion about $2 gas in Asia. Okay, we've got had a fair bit of discussion about $2 gas, and indeed the spot price in Asian gas was down in this region in the $2, $2 that's to US dollars, of course, per million BTU. But the contract price is up here. So in terms of gas um, gas sales from Australia to Asia, we've seen prices stay modest, well, higher than you would think um, from looking at the spot price. Um, of course, that those indicators are lagged and averaged, but having said, and they, obviously receipts will fall from the 50 odd billion that we had last year. So let's go, let's go on. Okay. So, just comparing last year's with this year's, we owe 2019 average GDP growth over the next 10 years. Obviously, um, that's energy demand growing at about 1% per annum. We've immediately seen um, a drop in projected GDP growth and with an immediate impact. But as I said, a V-shaped recovery. So things, things get back on track, energy demand is still relatively low. Um, in the next scenario, the delayed recovery scenario, we see that energy demand growth is probably the lowest we've seen for the best part of 100 years. Very slow demand growth, uh, very low GDP growth, with some very important, um, important, let me just, yeah. That's energy demand would return for around about 2023, um, but in a delayed recovery to take the best part of five years. So obviously the shape of the recovery has a very dramatic an immediate impact on energy demand or the GDP growth to start with. Just to have a look at what happened, this is just a little different um, portrayal of the in early information. We saw oil, coal and gas demand fall um, over the, the year. If we, we look forward the next 10 years or so, um, we see oil demand recovering rather slowly. Um, coal, no, coal continues to fall. Um, gas, um, for reasons I can talk about at length, um, gas stays still fairly strong, nuclear pretty flat. <clears throat> Modern renewables, the big, big growth story. Um, particularly in the power sector, we see something like 60 to 70 percent of demand growth being met by modern renewables. Um, when we look at the delayed recovery scenario, we see modern renewables almost immune from that, um, whereas uh, the fossil fuels are not, and in particular coal, um, coal takes a very large hit. Um, and indeed, well, I'll talk about the uh, overall shape for coal um, a little bit further on in proceedings. So um, there's a lot of talk in Australia about technology and how technology is the key um, to, to bringing about greenhouse gas savings. I just wanted to make a little point about behaviour. And of course, this year has been a very interesting year for behavioural experiments. We've seen um, a number of, um, number of uh, things adopted, teleworking being um, the most obvious one for all of us, fewer flights, definitely that for me, a lot of other people as well. Um, so those have reduced demand, but of course, some of the other behavioural impacts <clears throat> are having the opposite impact, low fleet turnover, less use of public transport. So on balance, on balance, 2020 behaviourally provide a lot of interesting insights, but not a lot of um, large contribution to curbing demand. So 
oil demand, there's a fair bit of talk about peak demand, and that's where we were last year. That's the that's steps, and as you see a recovery, but a continuation on a growth path, which might see oil demand flattening uh, in the next decade. And even in DRS, we continue to see growing demand. Um, if we are to um, achieve lower emissions, we need to do something like that, um, or really start to turn that around and turn it around pretty quickly, um, building on fall that we've seen in the last uh, in the last year. Uh, I might add that just you notice here we talk about how we might achieve that efficiency. Obvious, um, Australia sadly has no vehicle efficiency standards. Um, electrification again, Australia. Um, has no electric vehicle policy and recycling because one of the biggest areas of oil demand is actually um, in plastics, petrochemical manufacture rather the energy sector. Um, so one of the key impacts <coughs> of, of uh, the fall in oil prices has been a fall in the value of oil and gas assets. I'll just turn my notes here. Um, what's that's led to a rough drop in 25% in the value of those oil and gas assets. And that's had an immediate impact in terms of investment, as I said earlier, but also for countries that are heavily dependent on particularly on oil, it means some very tough decisions have to be made. Obviously those countries, the Middle East and Russia, will have some very, very interesting um, decisions to make. If we, if we do look at the sustainable development scenario, we see a much, much larger flaw. Having said that, of course, those oil and gas assets are still worth uh, on that graphic about $12 trillion. That's, that's a very significant sum, but it's um, roughly a halving of the value of those assets. So that puts some pretty severe pressure on um, everyone involved in the industry to think very hard about their strategies and business models. Well, just to take one example in the US, again, we've seen a rough halving of the, the drill count over the last year. And of course that will have implications for um, for production quite quickly because depletion on a lot of the uh, the wells in the US is quite rapid. Uh, I should add, of course, that, that the shale oil has represented something like two thirds, has met about two thirds of the growth in oil demand over the last decade. So what happens in the US is actually quite important in terms of, of markets. Okay, this is quite an important slide um, and a very key message. Um, I mentioned earlier that we spend a lot of time evaluating policy and the point of that is to look at the adequacy of that policy and of course steps for stated policies um, is a very long way from putting emissions into a decisive decline. Yes, a little bit of a hiccup from the 30, 36 uh, gigatons of we saw last year, um, as I said, down about 7% and in some cases like the US um, down 10%, um, in Australia only about 3%, we'll come back to that a bit later. That's where we need to be in the sustainable development scenario. And that's, as you can see, already a very ambitious target um, in net zero by 2070 or thereabouts. Um, a number of countries have made 2050 net zero pledges and we've highlighted there the, the EU, UK, and New Zealand. And of course, subsequent to the WEA being published, that number has been joined by Japan and Korea to have our largest trading partners, China with a 2060 goal and uh, hopefully and perhaps almost certainly the United States. And all of those countries taken together probably account for, I uh, should have worked this out before, roughly two thirds of global emissions. So the full implementation of those, those pledges um, will go quite some way. We've made a rough stab at China. I'll come back to that. Of course, that was only a, a relatively recent announcement. The, the upcoming five year plan, I guess, what, the 14th five year plan will be very, very important to that to the implementation of that uh, that pledge. We've still got that to come, of course, and as I said, a couple of countries have joined in, um, which, you know, which will be able to model in due course. But of course, net zero takes us on this trajectory, and that's a very, very ambitious um, trajectory. I'll come back to that graph towards the end, um, but just keep that animation in mind. So just turning quickly to electricity, and one of the, the key things about electricity is it's important it's growing importance as a share of total final consumption. And indeed, in any low emission strategy, um, low carbon electricity has to play an increasing role, um, not just decarbonising the existing grid, but, a, but a, uh, an increasing volume. 
And already you notice there, China um, already growing from um, seven, well, just, just shy of 7,000 terawatt hours to 11,000, trying to think, 11, just shy of 11,000 terawatt hours. Just for information, Australia on that scale is about um, 240. So um, six, 7,000 um, terawatt hour, China is approximately getting on towards 30 Australia's even as we speak. India as well, um, the US not so much growth, but certainly India and China, um, anywhere that's developing Southeast Asia, the need for electricity, that, and that's, that's under steps. Solar PV, clearly when we look at the um, levelised cost of generation, solar PV is clearly um, the cheapest form of electricity, with one important caveat, which I'll come to in a second. If we look at growth, what's happened over the last um, decade, there are the grey bars, and again, at scale, um, thousands of terawatt hours is a, is a massive unit. Um, you know, 4,000 terawatt hours is roughly the US total power use. This is global growth now, and of course, it's um, 16 odd Australias. For the next 20 years, if we look, we can see coal-fired power declining. Again, I can talk why that, why we think it's happening. Um, other low carbon, but wind and solar PV are clearly big growth areas. Gas is still there in the mix and still growing. And again, the flexibility that gas provides and flexibility is a key word in any, 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 any energy transition. Under the sustainable scenario, coal-fired coal power, as I said, 8,000 terawatt hour decline over 20 years. That's a massive decline, certainly in steam coal use. Gas um, declines, but quite a bit more slowly. Other low carbon wind grows strongly, but solar PV is the key technology over those over the next 20 years. One of the key reasons why solar PV has become so cheap and technology has a lot to do with it and deployment has a lot to do with it. But when you look at the cost of capital to raise solar PV, we're seeing some of the lowest capital costs around. And that's partly, well not partly, but heavily due to the fact that people have guarantees for the energy and that reduces risk. And of course, in the case of solar, it's all about the upfront capital. And if you can reduce the risk associated with the revenue and return on that, then you can reduce the cost of capital. And it's very important um, from a policy viewpoint that governments realise that. And we've seen it in countries like India, a very low cost of capital because the relatively guaranteed returns for that electricity. So something to bear in mind from a policy viewpoint, yes, solar PV is cheap, but government policies can certainly make it cheaper and make it deployed faster. Okay, so as we, we look at the electricity grid and we see that increase in wind and solar in particular, we know that those sources are variable and they will need to be um, firmed up if electricity is to remain secure. And the way that flexibility is delivered um, for essentially four main techniques, um, one, existing flexibility in existing power, power plants. Secondly, increased transmission links. Thirdly, storage mechanisms, particularly batteries, pumped hydro in Australia. Andrew Blake has done a lot of good work on that. And finally, demand side response. Now, the response of in, how those four measures will be used depends heavily on where, where you are. In the case of the United States, gas plays a very important part. In the case of China, transmission is very important. In the case of India, it's batteries. But in all, all areas, transmission is a very, very important part, not just replacing, but augmenting transmission links and building new ones to bring in plants that are not necessarily located where existing grids are. Which brings me to the point about grid expansion. And even in, even in steps, we see the need for a dramatic global expansion in grids. The only drawback with that, of course, is that many policy environments are not well suited to deliver that investment. Um, I might leave it to Nicola to reflect on um, the Australian policy environment, but certainly I think it's pretty clear now that the um, grid expansion and grid connections are now a major barrier to expanding solar and wind in Australia. If she disagrees, I'm sure she'll say so. Um, one of the problems we've seen globally is that operator revenue has dropped very sharply um, in just in the three countries we've seen. And of course, if these operators are to expand the grid as dramatically as we say, um, then this is a major issue. Um, certainly when I come to China, if I get time, I'll talk about the China grid issue as well, because that's a major barrier in that country. It's a major barrier in most of the countries we look at. Turning quickly to fuels, 
every fuel obviously is heavily dependent on the rate at which um, we reduce emissions of fossil fuels. You can see there um, the steps in solid and dotted SDS, um, oil and coal fall quickly. Natural gas, quite a bit less so, it still has to fall over the next 20 years. You can see the peak in natural gas is, is, is you know, further out in the decade. Uh, in the case of oil, it's the next few years. In the case of coal, it, it's already happened. And low carbon fuels, of course, growing rapidly. If we, just if we look at individual fuels, the case of oil, as I said before, without, the pol without policy action, we will not see that decline in oil use. Um, steps doesn't get us there. Um, on the right hand side, you can see the areas where we need to make changes. Vehicles obviously high on the list, but long distance transport and petrochemicals quite a bit harder to do, uh, at least at the moment with electricity. It's moving quickly on to gas. Um, a lot of talk in this country about gas as transition fuel and in, in the case of steps, that's certainly true. Um, we see quite a bit of growth um, in that, in, but in the case of SDS, um, quite, a bit, quite a bit less. Still quite important, certainly in the next decade, but um, you notice there we've got CCUS, um, fairly large chunk of, of gas as well. I'll we'll come back to that when we talk about net zero. Finally, to coal, um, coal looks increasingly challenged. And I think it's fair to say when we look at, say, even under steps, we see um, coal demand declining and the global coal trade, a relatively small share of actual total global coal use, coal trade declines. And in SDS, of course, it declines quite dramatically um, by a factor of about a half. I should distinguish here between steaming and coking coal. Um, coking coal holds up quite a bit better than steaming coal. So just, um, just a nice little one on the question of methane, a lot of discussion around methane. We now have um, satellite ability to observe methane around the planet. Of course, it is very important if we're using fossil fuels and particularly gas, that we keep methane leakage to as small as possible. And of course, one of the nice things about um, the election of Joe Biden, he'll almost certainly uh, reverse one of the things that Barack Obama introduced were standards for methane release and uh, the, uh, the incumbent president reversed those standards. In fact, he abolished them. Um, we can look forward to them being reinstated because of course the, the United States is the world's biggest gas producer um, as we speak and indeed um, a fairly large oil producer as well, like the largest. So um, turning to, and I'm doing okay on time, we're whizzing along here, turning to SDS and particularly the net zero in 2050 scenarios, um, quite a bit to say here. So I guess the first thing to note is um, having an economy that gets um, knocked for six is not a sustainable way to reduce emissions. Yes, the US economy did reduce emissions by 10% um, over the course of the pandemic. And uh, Australia said it was only 3%, but I think most people anticipate that energy demand and emissions will bounce back if and when the recovery happens. What, what we need is a sustainable recovery and that can only happen um, with very significant policy changes, which we'll talk about in due course. Um, let's move on. So that's just comparing the emission numbers. In the case of SDS, we have emissions falling from, um, well, from 36 gigatons last year, from 33 current levels, down about 27. So already in the next decade, that's a very substantial fall. Um, that would require a fall pretty much equivalent to what we've seen in the last year to say that 7% fall would need to be projected right through to 2020 every single year, hopefully not at the cost of the economy, which would obviously be completely unimaginable, but using policy measures. And we just outlined the three key ones there, which I go into in a fair amount of detail. So 27 gigatons already um, reduced by a quarter from 2019 levels. It's not just about electricity. Um, spend a lot of time talking about electricity, but we need also to have um, different energy sources. Um, liquid biofuels need to grow very sharply. Biogas. Um, gas delivers some very important flexibility services, but obviously in a decarbonising or a zero carbon economy, gas has no place. It needs to be replaced with something if those flexibility services continue to be delivered by gas. And of course, biogas and hydrogen are two key measures, uh, two key technologies which we can see growing and growing very substantially 
um, particularly in the case of hydrogen, something went wrong with my, yeah, we, okay, we got, particularly in the sustainable scenario for hydrogen, um, understated policies, we have some growth, but that's almost at the pilot level. Innovations driven by deployment. This is a really significant point I want to make. We've got brown is the steps, um, SDS is the green. And one of the things we've learned in the last decade or so is how um, governments by setting targets, key targets can drive deployment and hence deployment drives economies of scale, drives learning by doing, drives down costs. We've seen that already in um, solar panels for sure and technology. Um, yes, has made a big contribution, but it's been driven very heavily by government policy. We're starting to see it again in um, offshore wind, where uh, what, the, what the British Prime Minister likes to call a coalition of the willing, um, Germany, Denmark, the United Kingdom in particular, set very ambitious targets for offshore wind, and we've seen costs come down very dramatically in the case of increased deployment, learning by doing economies of scale. British Prime Minister set a target of 40 gigawatts of offshore wind uh, very ambitious target. Uh, hydrogen is a really interesting one there you can see, but also heat pumps over on the side, obviously electric vehicle technology, electric technology, electric vehicles as well. But I think hydrogen is a really interesting one. So towards net zero, I've skipped rather quickly through that, but just to reiterate that slide that I had earlier, the world is not on a um, clear path to achieve decisive decline. Um, the net zero, um, which we're seeing now an increasing number of countries, and as I said, joined very recently by Japan, Korea, China, and hopefully the United States, um, but the existing countries would provide a very, very powerful coalition. It would, of course, mean that the, that grey area will be quite a bit smaller, and that grey area of countries um, would have to contribute um, their fair share as well if we are to get to net zero. So when you look at the graph, um, by 2030, that implies reducing the steps, which is already quite an ambitious drop of 25% from 2019 levels. We're down to 20 gigatons. So we're down to about 40, about a 40 to 45% fall in emissions. And even some countries are actually talking about even doing that even quicker. Italy's, Italy's got a 55% target and certainly a number of countries are talking about a 50% reduction. And the way we do that is relatively, well, let me, relatively straightforward to say, one, we decarbonise the power sector. Two, we push the electricity use as much higher percentage of total final consumption um, through electric vehicles, obviously, in the transport sector, in the low temperature heat. Uh, thirdly, we must make um, energy use much more efficient. And of course, electrification is very helpful in that regard. Um, both when I say energy efficiency, that means buildings, it means houses, it means everything that uses energy. It means industry, and some of those industries, coal and steel, uh, steel and cement, are going to be really, really tough. So it's quite important to make upfront savings um, because those other sectors need technologies that we're only just starting to think about deploying uh, at scale. As I said, energy efficiency has to accelerate. Um, it's already, it is coming down, but it needs to accelerate and in fact double in the next 10 years from where we thought was realistic. And if we look over on the right hand side, the impact on demand, and those bottom bars respectively, something went wrong with my computer there, um, coal, oil and gas. You notice that coal obviously takes the biggest hit because electrification of the power sector. Um, oil, electrification of transport. Um, gas, quite a bit less so, and again, because it's such an important part um, of the flexibility services that I talked about earlier. Um, just as an aside, in terms of, of energy, um, if we look at Northern Europe or America, um, in the winter heating season, gas delivers more energy than electricity at the moment. Uh, and that's actually true in the ACT and um, in Victoria and Southern Australia in general. So replacing those flexibility services is, is really tough. We can do it with either biogas or hydrogen, or we can do it with electricity. But of course, that means electricity has to be able to deliver that peak service, which means we need more capacity and even more generation. Certainly, as I said, decarbonising electricity, you can see the track here for coal-fired power by 2030, subcritical and supercritical um, generators pretty much extinct. Um, over on the right-hand side, we've got some of the 
deployment numbers in gigawatts for solar power relative to the historical peaks. You can see China, which has done 50 gigawatts, and that's really a big number, um, needs to essentially quadruple that, and that goes for most countries as well. We're looking at some very, very significant increases in solar PV deployment rates. So I do want to compare and contrast Australia with, the, with one particular country, and well, the United Kingdom and the EU. So the United Kingdom, this is their power sector um, generation over the last 30 years. And of course, that 30 year time for, for table takes us out from now at the 2050. So it's good to look back over 30 years. And if you look back at 1990, you can see the dominance of coal. And by 2019, coal has almost disappeared from the mix. Um, if we look at, we compare emissions between 2008 and 2019, we see that on the basis of these structural changes, and of course, wind and solar down the bottom there are quite important, um, but we can see that emissions have fallen by two thirds. I guess the other important thing to note is um, demand has fallen from 400 terawatt hours, 400,000 gigawatt hours, 400 down to about 320 on the basis of very strongly applied efficiency technologies, especially in housing. Um, UK housing was generally regarded as very poor quality. Spent a lot of time on housing, um, a lot of time on things like lighting. Um, as you've been to Europe will know, it's pretty hard to buy an incandescent light globe these days. They've been pretty much replaced by um, by LEDs. The LED lighting is dramatically improved in quality and price, um, roughly one tenth of the energy use for the same amount of, of lumens. And again, deployment policies have had a very big driver effect on that. Just so looking to the future, we've got on the, the left hand side 2008 2018, we can see in fact that coal at the bottom. Uh, basically, it has already disappeared. And in fact, it's been replaced essentially by renewables, that green bar at the top, the coal and renewables have switched, switched their percentages um, in the decade. P pretty important achievement. We look to 2050 and we see a number of interesting things. We see that gas has almost completely disappeared as well, still quite significant um, in 2018. We see nuclear is, is still around, but quite a bit smaller, and we see renewables. Um, we also see at the top natural gas with CCS, um, and that's that is actually designed to make um, some of the with um, used in biological um, biomass use will actually make the power sector in Britain actually emission negative. What that graph doesn't show, of course, is based to 100% is the fact that the um, electricity grid will go from producing around about 300, um, 300 terawatt hours with a little bit of imports at the moment up to about 650 terawatt hours in the next 30 years. So a very dramatic expansion of the grid and a very dramatic decarbonisation, but one that the historical record gives some um, some credence to. And if you know, those of you who listen to Boris Johnson's statement, his 10 point plan to make that happen, uh, including the famous 40 gigawatts of of uh, offshore wind, but also very significant energy efficiency initiatives. If we look at the EU and see what they are planning to do, and they're, they're quite advanced in their planning as well. First of all, we can see that, again, decarbonisation has already advanced quite a way. We've got decarbonised technologies on the right, um, emitting technologies on the left. Oil, of course, pretty much disappeared from the power sector in most OECD countries. Gas and coal, still fairly prominent, about 1,000 terawatt hours. By 2030, um, coal has disappeared, and by well 2040, in fact, um, gas has almost disappeared as well, to be replaced by a whole suite of, of um, well, essentially renewable technologies. Those first three bars, nuclear, bio, and hydro, don't change a great deal, but offshore and onshore wind and solar PV definitely change a great deal. And as you can see, the grid, the EU grid, expands from around about a 3,000 terawatt hour grid to um, about 4,000, I think it's about 4,800, in fact, um, over that time frame, And that, of course, implies a very significant amount of energy efficiency as well. So there are countries and groups of countries with very um, well-developed plans to make this transition happen, led by the power sector. When we look at what's happened in Australia, um, we have seen a very remarkable gain. Um, some of the work done here at the ANU, um, Professor Blakers, uh, Matt Stocks, um, Ken Baldwin, um, on a per capita basis, that, that is a dramatic deployment of solar PV and wind. Um, just to take solar PV, 2016 to 2019 on those numbers is a rough tripling 
of uh, generation from solar. And um, as of basically as of now, we have about 33 terawatt hours of, of wind and solar from, from virtually nothing um, 15 years ago. And most of that has happened, as you can see from that graph, in the last four years. And the Clean Energy Regulator is very confident that that will continue, um, certainly driven by some, some of the state renewable energy targets that are out there, um, something towards 50% of the power sector uh, by 2030. Um, solar rooftop, which I, I don't think is included in those numbers, stands at about 12 gigawatts and um, set to double over the next four to five years to about 24 gigawatts. A nice slogan there, 24 gigawatts by 2024. Uh, I'm sure our Prime Minister could pick that up if he was, if he was so of a mind. Um, what is interesting when we put that on the same chart as we had before for the United Kingdom, and that again is generation in our power sector, we can see that firstly, power demand has continued to rise. And although the share of coal has fallen from about 80% back in 2000 or thereabouts to around about 60% now, in fact, the fall in emissions from that sector, it's, it's, it's significant, it's about 5% per annum, uh, at least it was last year, um, but it's nowhere near as significant as what we've seen in the United Kingdom. At the same time period, 2008, 2019, the falls been about 15%. 2020, of course, um, a rather atypical year, but still we have seen a fall um, in the power sector of around about 5%. Whether we see a rebound or not well, it remains to be seen. But of course, that means that Australia, when we look at Australia's emissions, we're not seeing anywhere near the drop. And indeed, the, um, the projections that were done last year by, by the department show practically no drop or a very small drop, I think about 4% by 2030, notwithstanding the fact that the projections that were done at the time um, include the 50% renewable power figure, and they include a very significant number of electric vehicles as well, which we're sales, which we are not seeing in Australia at the moment. <clears throat> Turning to China, now this is obviously not an IEA slide because it happened after the WIA, but this is from a, an IEA alumnus, a chap called Xavier Chen, who I, I know quite well, he's working back in Beijing these days, and he's put out some um, his thoughts on what a net zero might look like in China. First of all, coal. Um, coal peaked in China in 2013. Um, it's, when I say peak, it's been a rather flat peak because it's only fallen about three or four percent uh, since that time, but nevertheless it is falling. Um, under the scenario that he's envisaged, oil would peak quite soon. Uh, gas would peak quite a bit later. Um, gas use in China has grown sixfold over the last 15 years, and it's driven by a number of factors that need for diversification, but air quality considerations in, in cities. Um, China is, is now a very big gas user in excess of 300, 300 billion cubic metres. Electricity would, ha would have to double, and I think you've seen that already in some of the slides presented. Um, the 2050 um, would imply 15,000 terawatt hour grid in China, 15,000 terawatt hours. That's roughly 60 Australias, uh, equivalent of the current in Australia and more than 90% of that would be decarbonised. Um, nuclear, hydro, biomass, solar and wind, obviously very important, but with a very important caveat about the need for distribution and indeed the regulatory regime that will enable those distribution lines to be expanded at the rate required is, is a very big barrier. And again, I raised that earlier in the presentation. That's pretty much um, true in a number of countries. But the most important point, which I've bolded, is that energy efficiency is by far the most important contributor to decarbonisation. You might argue they have plenty of scope for that, um, and you'd be true, but um, still, that will require a very, very significant transformation. I might add, in the case of oil, of course, the Chinese motives for wanting to reduce oil demand are very obvious. Um, they are now the world's biggest oil importer and they're heavily dependent um, on imports from the Middle East, as, as is Australia. Um, but the Chinese are very worried about energy security, as Australia apparently is not. And uh, as a result of that, they are taking steps to reduce oil demand, uh, electric vehicles being the, the most obvious one, electric two-wheelers. Anyone who's been to China knows there's plenty of electric two-wheeler vehicles around, as indeed there is in Australia. Um, it's not just about electricity, of course. As I said, passenger cars have to accelerate and accelerate very dramatically in the, in the net zero. Already electric vehicles would need to make up 60% of new car sales um, in, by the end of the decade. Uh, and similarly, 
it's not just about technology, behaviour will need to be important and the IEA has analysed a whole range, which I'm not going to go through there, but how that can save um, energy use um, and how some of the lessons we've learnt in this last year might be applied in a, in a longer term to reduce uh, emissions while still maintaining economic activity. So, uh, just to quickly summarise, first of all, a whole collection of things have to happen by companies. In particular, we look at, say, just hydrogen. Over the next 10 years, we would need to increase by a factor of 100 hydrogen production. Um, that would take it from being pilot stage to being pretty much a commercial technology. Case of electric vehicles, we would have to, as I said, accelerate to well over half the new cars sold globally. Um, 2.5 million, China being the biggest contributor to that number, just to pick one example. And thirdly, finance, and we've seen some very, I haven't mentioned finance much at all, um, but we've already seen some very important moves by finance and indeed um, energy using companies to commit to net zero as well. Just in terms of investment, clean, en clean electricity investment, essentially solar and wind, um, would need to more than quadruple over the next decade. Um, that's annual investment, of course, uh, and that is a pretty significant number. Uh, just the key point here about, of course, companies, citizens and investors, but most of all, governments. So um, I think I've run my course pretty nicely, but just to conclude the quiz, um, I recycled that one from last year. Most people seem to have got that right, actually. Um, SUVs are the biggest contributor um, in the last decade or thereabouts to emissions growth. And in Australia, I can comfortably say is a world leader in SUV sales. SUV sales um, are more than half our new vehicle sales. And of course, that has not done good things for fuel economy. As I said, we have said repeatedly, we are an outlier in a number of aspects, and that's one of them on energy efficiency. We have no vehicle efficiency standards. The government, Ken asked me this last year, why, why aren't we doing that? Scott Morrison actually answered my question for me. He actually said the government wasn't going to tell people what vehicles to buy. I might add fuel efficiency standards can be a very powerful tool to promote electric vehicle purchases as well, cross-subsidising um, heavy fuel users to low fuel, fuel users. Secondly, so existing infrastructure. Um, the last 20 years or so in particular, we've seen in China just, well, globally we've seen 2,000 gigawatts of coal-fired plant built, um, well, well over 1,000, uh, sorry, a billion tonnes of steel making capacity built. Again, especially in China, um, the years 2000 to 2012 in particular. When we look at if those, if we replace them all, all the new um, equipment with zero emissions, those, those emissions would still be with us in the case of power, uh, that's power at the bottom and industry than other, um, that emissions over the next 40 to 50 years or so would total 700 gigatons and would lead to an increase in temperature of, of wait for it, uh, 1.65 degrees. Uh, I think that was at the outer edge of what most people expected. So one of the issues we do need to address in a net zero, net zero scenario is how do we cope with those assets those assets in particular, things like coal-fired power stations, which need to be repurposed, retrofitted or retired, um, because just operating the existing assets, of course, uh, means climate goals are, are lost. It's an interesting one about demand and supply here. If, if we have no new investment at all in the case of oil, um, oil production capacity falls from just under 100 million barrels last year to around about 20 million barrels by around about 80%. When we look at our various scenarios, you can see their steps, oil demand is relatively flat, um, just increasing slightly. Um, the next line down is the SDS demand curve. And even to meet the SDS demand curve, we would need um, new investment in existing fields, so-called brownfield investment. We need new field investment. And in the case of steps, we need additional new fields, um, which we haven't really even discovered yet. So we need to invest continuously, and, and we've seen that um, similar, a similar curve exists for the gas industry, a bit less so for coal. Um, but what that means is we need to have a pretty clear idea of where we're going 
both globally, regionally and nationally. Um, if people are going to invest, um, they've got to be somewhere in that curve and how they invest, but we can't stop investing even, even in a net zero um, emissions. We still need um, particularly gas, um, oil and coal less so, but we're still going to need some new investment. So, and lastly, um, yeah, a little over 21% uh, comes in Australia and that's pretty much in line with the OECD average. Um, it has been increasing over recent years um, and obviously in a decarbonising world, um, that share will need to increase. In the case of the EU, from memory, it's got to go from about 21% to 38%. So this is probably not, not too bad a proxy for Australia. Um, UK is pretty much the same. But of course, it highlights the point that it's not just about the electricity sector. A lot of journalists confuse energy and electricity. Yes, electricity will deliver energy services more efficiently, certainly for vehicles, um, a lot of services, lighting and so on. We can, we can make big energy efficiency gains, but it's not just about electricity. So to conclude, whether it's still an open book, some countries, some regions, the EU being a good example, um, have used this as a catalyst, part of a very large part of their recovery plan will focus on green energy transition. Renewables are taking off, solar leading the way, but grids are very going to be a very big limiting factor, and I'm sure Nicola will talk a little bit about that. Oil and gas revenues have been squeezed, and producers are going to have to make some adjustments to that. And we can talk a little bit about what that means for Australia, if you like. Going in net zero means a very, very sharp increase in a whole collection of technologies, not just um, low carbon electricity, but innovation through hydrogen, other low carbon fuels, battery, carbon capture and storage, probably used with gas uh, and with some industrial processes. And those, some of those technologies will take time. Although I guess one of the good things about this year, we've, we've discovered that we can develop vaccines much quicker than we thought as well. No shortcuts, only very significant changes. And those changes are not just technological, they're behavioural, um, they're about the way we do business for all of us, citizens, investors, companies, but clearly most of all for governments. Clear policy um, roles, clear policy guidance, forming coalitions of the willing, to borrow, borrow Boris Johnson's phrase from a different context, um, can make a very important change. So I think I've just about done my dash there. Um, so at that point, I shall sign off. Wonderful, and thank you very much, Ian, for such a great exposition uh, again of the WIO. Um, just noting that uh, <coughs> the aggregate uh, scores in the uh, poll show that our audience got a bare pass today, two out of four questions right. Um, they just uh, 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 were... Uh, correct on the 1.7 degree question and also uh, the uh, percentage of Australia's electricity as a function of total energy use, um, but missed out on the SUV um, question and also on the uh, question about uh, oil production, although not by much on the oil production one, but uh, the SUV one's a bit of an eye opener, I think, and uh, Australia now leads the world in terms of percentage SUV ownership. So this is uh, really a very interesting uh, set of uh, numbers. So um, now everyone uh, has the opportunity to start putting uh, their own questions in the Q&A box uh, to Ian and to the panel. Uh, and indeed the panel members will now present their own perspectives on the World Energy Outlook 2020. Uh, just very uh, briefly, the panel members are Nicola Falcon, who is the General Manager of Forecasting for the Australian Energy Market Operator. Uh, Professor Kylie Catchpole from the uh, ANU Research School of Electrical Energy and Materials Engineering. Uh, Luke Menzel, CEO of the Energy Efficiency Council. And Professor Stephen Wilson, Director of the University of Queensland Centre for Energy Futures. So the panellists will now uh, have the opportunity to give their own viewpoints on uh, the World Energy Outlook in different uh, areas. And I'd like to invite uh, Nicola Falcon from AEMO uh, to talk a little bit about uh, potentially some of the, th the impacts that this might have on uh, AEMO's integrated system plan, amongst other things. Over to you, Nicola. Thanks, Ken, and, and afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks, Ian, for, for a fascinating presentation. Um, is it really, I thought I would uh, just open up with a few observations around how um, 
the, the outlook really aligns with a lot of the observations we already make with the ISP. Uh, so I've got a, two or three points just to really cover off quite quickly before we go out to broader discussion. Uh, the first one is, is really around uh, the impact of the pandemic on the uh, energy sector and in particular the electricity sector here in Australia. Um, we're actually not seeing uh, as much of a drop as we probably anticipated at the beginning. And, and you know, we're, we're all used this word unprecedented times, uh, probably a lot more than anyone wants to uh, again in the future. But, you know, very, very difficult, obviously, to forecast things when we haven't really got any sort of reference or experience to assess it based on it. But, but Australia's actually been holding up reasonably well in terms of its electricity demand at the moment, probably for a number of obvious reasons, including the fact that, uh, you know, we've been uh, somewhat lucky in, in being a, a continent that's relatively isolated from, from a lot, lot of the impact. Um, and also I note that in the uh, WIO, some of the um, drop is due to sort of the reversal of electrification in, pro in developing countries, which is, is not so much of an issue in Australia. But the pandemic is far from over and uh, we published just in our summer readiness report last week, um, you know, um, some still are concerns around uncertainty of what demand will be this summer, uh, particularly as we're starting to see people working from home as well as people in offices and, and, and uh, you could find that therefore you've got demand uh, in, in both premises more than you would normally. So we're certainly keeping an eye on just what the pandemic is going to do from a demand perspective. But it could be that for us, demand actually goes up, uh, particularly during peak demand uh, times. Look, scenarios are really important for assessing uncertainties, and, and we have done um, a number of sensitivities around the impact of COVID, but we've also used the scenarios more broadly to develop uh, ISP um, future worlds that we've looked at for the 2020 ISP, and in fact, we're starting to look at it again now for the 2022. Um, Obviously, when you've got uh, such uncertainties and you're trying to plan and invest in, in grids for 20, 40, 60 years, uh, it becomes really, really important to understand um, how that world might play out uh, and how to build sort of a robust investment around that. So we use scenarios not only to look at uh, how the uh, investment might unfold under different scenarios, but also what decisions do we need to make now um, and how will we be able to adapt those decisions over time if, if any one of these different sort of futures unfold. So really important from a decision-making perspective to uh, build flexibility into the system given there is just so much uncertainty. In the 2020 ISP, we had uh, five scenarios that were really built around two key dimensions. One was decarbonisation and one was uh, decentralisation. Uh, and feedback we received uh, during uh, the course of, of those scenarios and then also after we published the 2020 ISP was to you know, push at least uh, one scenario beyond the decarbonisation objectives that we had in the step change. And I think, again, that's quite consistent with the feedback that uh, IEA had received in developing their scenarios this year. Um, so we're looking at a scenario that, that does uh, not only look, focus on decarbonisation of the energy sector or the electricity sector, but also some of the de decarbonisation of other sectors and uh, how that might lead to increased electrification. So very, very similar to what Ian was sort of flagging there about a doubling of energy demand and, and how's that going to uh, impact on the NEM uh, and what the role hydrogen might have in, in that as well if we get to the sorts of uh, future worlds of uh, hydrogen being a super uh, power for export. Um, other things we're looking at in our scenarios are around things like the gas-led recovery uh, that's been talked about, what would happen if we were able to achieve lower gas prices, would that make gas a transition fuel more than what we currently have been forecasting in the ISP? So again, quite similar to some of the stuff that Ian covered off on. But it's been really quite timely to get these WEO scenarios coming out, I have to say, because it means that we can link our scenario development to uh, global narratives and uh, look at some of the alignment about what would be uh, driving technologies from a global perspective. A couple of other insights just very quickly. Um, one is more generally about decarbonising the energy sector and uh, certainly in our 2020 ISP we saw that the most economically efficient way to replace up to 63% of our coal fleet in the next 20 years was uh, with a portfolio of renewable generation, both grid scale and behind the meter, uh, dispatchable storage, uh, 
and uh, really have that uh, complemented by transmission. And uh, certainly we saw, again, very similar to the WIO, that uh, transmission played an even greater role in scenarios where you've got more decarbonisation. And uh, Marinus Link, which is the interconnector between Tasmania and the mainland, was a, a case in point. Um, it is uh, great to see that it's entirely consistent with the IEA's own findings about renewable energy and storage and the, the continued declining costs of them and, and uh, you know, the comments around solar becoming the new king of electricity. Um, agree that we definitely need flexibility in such a power system and we've seen transmission and uh, distribution playing a large role in that, as uh, Ian was sort of uh, alluding to. But one of the things that I found um, quite interesting was that there was a, a comment in the report around uh, in the networks becoming a weak link in the chain um, and, and some uh, concerns around some of the regulatory arrangements that will need to be in place to make sure that um, transmission and generation can be uh, coordinated or enabled um, and, and, and play a key role in this energy transition. Um, you know, we are grappling with something very similar here in Australia we noticed, as you may or may not be aware, that just recently Electronet and Transgrid actually submitted a financeability rule change to the AMC to consider um, to help sort of manage some of their, their uh, risks around financing ISP projects and, and being able to uh, maintain their credit ratings. You know, those sorts of things are real genuine concerns. The ISP um, might outline the best way to uh, deliver uh, transmission and generation to meet energy uh, transitions, but if uh, at the end of the day the, the risks for financing are too high, then you know that is also going to be a weak link. Um, from a regulatory point of view, uh, you'll probably all know the ESB and the market bodies are looking at ways that we can put market designs and, and reforms in place so that we can actually support that energy transition. But but those things are going to be really really important. Uh, you might also be aware that transmission costs in Australia are going up, or at least the estimates of costs have been going up quite considerably in the last year. Um, unless we can keep those costs in check, we might actually find ourselves in a position where some of those large transmission investments that we'd identified as delivering benefits of diversity and so forth may not actually end up being in the best interest of consumers, uh, in which case we're not going to see it as stronger interconnected uh, NEMS, and we might need to start relying more on technology to be able to deliver the reliable and secure supply in each region. So that's also something that we need to really be working on to try and keep transmission costs down um, so that they can actually act as enablers and, and um, make benefit of the geographic diversity that we have in this country. Uh, so they were probably uh, the main observations and, and uh, connections to the WIO. I think, uh, you know, we, as we go into our 2020 ISP, or 2022 ISP, uh, we are going to need to see what things like this uh, decarbonisation and electrification is going to mean for a transmission in our, our system. But it's going to be uh, really interesting to see the, the analysis as it comes out. Great. Yeah, quite many thanks for that perspective. And uh, interesting to hear that uh, the uh, next ISP is looking at a beyond uh, the step change scenario because uh, the latest clean energy regulator data shows that Indeed, installation of renewables is uh, heading on a track that's above that. So, uh, be uh, be interesting to see your next analysis uh, in that regard. Uh, okay. So, thank you very much, and uh, we'll now move to Professor Kylie Catchpole from ANU. Uh, Kylie is going to look into some aspects of technology trends, solar PV, and hydrogen for us. Uh, so, thank you, Ken. So, I'll just um, share my screen because I just have a, a few slides to show about this. Uh, yeah, so talking about technology trends in and renewable energy. So we ha have, have seen um, from Ian, and this has come out of AMO, of course, as well, that um, now the variable renewables, wind and solar, are the, are the cheapest forms of, of new energy. And that is even the, the case when you include several hours um, storage, which could be uh, from pumped hydro or from batteries. And this leads to this trend of electrification. So uh, we have the case where electric cars are cheaper to run um, than petrol cars and they can be now cheaper using renewable electricity as soon as the cost 
um, comes down, the capital costs come down, then um, the case for electric cars is, is clear uh, for everyone. And so we would expect to get that rapid take up. And similarly, um, reverse cycle air conditioning, which is a type of heat pump, can be cheaper than, than gas, and now it can also be cheaper than renewable electricity. So we change, then we get this uh, massive electrification through uh, transport, light duty transport, uh, and through heating applications. These are the very kind of natural trends um, that will tend to, to happen, uh, I think, with, without much push. And this is all um, driven by this, this reduction in, in costs. So Ian was, was talking about the how deployment can reduce the costs of technologies. And this just illustrates this trend for a range of different technologies here. So here we have uh, electrolyzers, we have fuel cells, we have solar, we have battery, uh, we have wind. And what we're showing here is the cost uh, relative to the initial cost as you install the technology. So every time you double the installation of the technology, you reduce the cost by a certain fraction. The fraction depends on that technology, but that's the learning curve that we talk about for all of these technologies. And that means as you deploy them, they continue to come down in price. And we've seen that uh, very dramatically, especially for solar uh, and now also for batteries. Uh, and so, if you look um, globally, you know, where are we actually um, producing emissions from? Uh, you can see that a large fraction of that is, is coming from power uh, and, and also from, from other sectors as well. But we're going to see this uh, decarbonisation of, of the power sector through all of these trends, especially uh, renewable energy. We will also tend to see this decarbonisation of that, that light uh, transport through electric vehicles. Um, we have the possibility for electrification um, of heating and cooling in, of buildings, but you do also have these sectors of the economy, as, as Ian referred to, um, that are hard to decarbonise, and that includes um, a fair bit of industry, and it also includes heavy duty freight. So those are the industries that are a little bit harder to deal with. They don't, at the moment, they don't have any economical decarbonisation options. So if you're looking further into the future, you have to say, okay, once we've done all this electrification and as we're doing all this electrification, what happens to these other sectors? Uh, so one of the things that people have been talking about for these other sectors uh, is the use of hydrogen. And when you're thinking about hydrogen, it's super important to remember that it's an energy carrier. It's not an energy source. So it's like electricity in that it moves energy around, but it's not actually a source of energy. So you have to produce it from somewhere. You can produce it um, from electrochemical means, so essentially using electricity. Uh, and then in that case, you can produce it from renewables, or you can produce it from fossil fuels, which is the way that it gets produced at the moment. So it's not inherently clean. It depends uh, how you produce it. And then you have a range of choices of where you can use it. Uh, the things that are Particularly interesting are the applications in, in high temperature heat uh, and also in, in chemical reactions, for example, for uh, reducing iron ore to produce iron. Uh, when you think about where we actually might use uh, hydrogen, you have to think about what it's competing against. And as I said, for transport, we already have battery electric vehicles. For low temperature heat, as in, as in houses and offices, uh, we have uh, heat pumps, these are economically attractive options already. They're easy to install, so that seems like the place that they will go. Um, the cases where we don't have good um, low carbon options are high temperature heat uh, and feedstock. So those are those hard sectors of the economy that need to decarbonise, and that's where um, things like hydrogen looks interesting. An important point when you're thinking about renewable hydrogen, again, I said, is where does it come from? And in terms of the cost of hydrogen, about half of your cost of renewable hydrogen is actually your cost of the electricity. So this is really important to remember, is that if you want to reduce the cost of hydrogen, you have to keep bringing down the cost of the electricity. So there's other things, including the electrolyzer, but about half of your cost is the actual electricity. <clears throat> 
Uh, and so the projections are um, that by 2050, we get to a point um, where hydrogen is competitive with hydrogen produced from fossil fuels. It may well happen faster than that. Uh, but it's important to note that this is depending on continued reductions in the cost of solar energy in particular. So this will come about through continuing development of solar energy, continuing deployment of solar energy, and that is one of the major reasons that you can um, produce this um, low-cost hydrogen. So overall, uh, not only does the electrification of the whole uh, energy sector depend on solar, but also uh, future options um, such as hydrogen also depend heavily on solar. So um, just to conclude, there is this pathway for renewable electricity for everything that you can electrify easily, and that means the current demand, um, extending that to light transport, extending that also to low temperature heat. You can decarbonize other sectors using hydrogen, but we are currently developing those technologies, so that will, uh, will take some time, and that includes heavy transport and high temperature heat and feedstock. But if we want to actually do this, we need to keep going down this path of, of reducing the cost of solar electricity further through that technology development and, and deployment. Terrific, Harvey. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, presentation. Uh, and for the, uh, the relevance, particularly on the hydrogen uh, aspects as an energy vector for uh, future uh, decarbonisation. Uh, so now uh, we welcome uh, Luke Menzel from the, Clean, uh, sorry, from the Energy Efficiency Council, and he'll be talking to us, obviously, uh, about energy efficiency measures as they relate to uh, the uh, various scenarios presented by the WIO. Over to you, Luke. Did you just almost introduce me as the CEO of the Clean Energy Council, Ken? <laughs> There's a faux pas. No, um, delighted to be here. Uh, and uh, thank you to ANU, to Ken, and, and obviously to Erica for the invitation. There was, um, there was one line that stood out to me uh, from, the, uh, from the WIO this year, and it's that there is no single storyline about the future. And it, it uh, reminded me that I've always thought of the WIO as a bit of a choose your own adventure book, um, books that I was, uh, I was obsessed by, obsessed about by, as a child. Um, and, I, and I don't know if you remember them, there's a decision point every three or four pages. Um, and in one of my personal favourites, the, the Cave of Time, uh, you sort of plunged into a, a cave in a place called Snake Canyon. There's two pa passageways. There's one heading towards the past and one heading towards the future. And the path you choose determines the trajectory for the rest of the story. Of course, I always cheated and sort of stuck my finger in the pages and went back and, and read, the, read all the stories I'd missed once I'd chosen a particular path. Unfortunately, we don't, we don't have that, uh, we don't have that uh, available to us with the energy transition that we're working through. But I, I think it, it underlines the fact that we are at an inflection point, and that's really the under, key underlying message from the IEA in the WIO this year. We're at a very consequential moment um, uh, in the midst of a global pandemic, governments are making absolutely eye-watering investments, um, which uh, have potentially transformative effects on the on the global economy um, and on infrastructure that's going to be baked in for for decades to come. So the message from the IEA has been to align recovery efforts with our goals around climate change and energy efficiency and electrification, uh, fuel switching has been right at the core of that. Um, so I've been asked to speak uh, on the energy efficiency elements of the WIO. And for WIO fans out there, that you won't be surprised that energy efficiency is crucial to the SDS. Um, it sort of bounces around 40-something percent of the heavy lifting for decarbonising the energy sector has to come from the WIO. Um, and the IEAs uh, has been raising their focus on energy efficiency for a, a number of years now. Um, they've got a dedicated energy efficiency office. They release the energy efficiency market report uh, every year. Um, uh, which is a dedicated report actually coming out, out this evening for those of you that are interested. Um, but while they've been ramping up those efforts, their, their, their rhetoric around energy efficiency, the amount of focus they're putting on energy efficiency has reached, reached an absolute crescendo in 2020. We, uh, we already had them convene a, a global commission for urgent action on energy efficiency in 2020. 19 that reported in june in 2020 um, with a raft of recommendations for for governments around the world to to uh, increase um, the rate of energy efficiency improvement to around around three percent a year 
Um, and then they also had the WIA report on sustainable recovery, which was released by the IEA and the IMF in June. Um, and that had a, at its core a recommendation for governments to focus on a range of clean energy investments, but energy efficiency uh, absolutely first among equals. And you see that reflected in the, in the formal WIO as well. But a lot, of the, a lot of what is in the WIO was actually stated previously in, in June. And, and it was done so in an effort from the IEA to provide advice to governments as early as possible while they were starting to craft their recovery plans. So why energy efficiency? Um, first and foremost, job creation mach machine. When you look at all the range of clean energy investments that are available, uh, uh, energy efficiency, particularly building upgrades, tops the charts. Uh, I think it's around 15 jobs per million of United States dollars that's invested in recovery and they're good local jobs. It's obviously productivity enhancing, something which governments always think about when they're making stimulatory investments. Um, we've had a few speakers talk to the fact that there's cheap direct emissions cuts, but there is also um, a, a benefit in terms of lowering the cost of supply side transition. So if we can bank some of those cost effective energy efficiency uh, upgrades, it means that the cost of transitioning the supply side um, of the market goes down as well. Um, there's a stimulatory effect for the manufacturing sector because you, if you're upgrading buildings, you're, you're uh, obviously you know, needing more building products. Um, and I think it was Kylie that said that um, uh, by taking some of the sensible things we know how to do, like building upgrades and electrification, it buys us time to, to work through some of the, the trickier problems we have in other sectors like, like steel and, and cement and other places. Um, so, there's another reason to invest in energy efficiency, which it's been particularly hard by, hit hard by the pandemic. Um, and that's another theme that you see in, see in the WIO this year. Um, our willingness, uh, speaking as I am here in Victoria, um, uh, in the midst of lockdown and in the midst of pandemic, to have tradies around to, to fix your insulation or fix your lights is relatively low, especially if it's not, a, not an essential upgrade. Um, uh, a poor economy means that the normal rate of appliance upgrades um, and other capital investments that business might, might normally be making actually actually goes down. Electricity and fuel costs are, are generally down, which means the business case for energy efficiency upgrades is, is lowered. And so the, what we've seen is a clear message from the IEA. It's like you, you could, you could uh, fill books with the reasons why, why government uh, should be investing in energy efficiency in particular at this moment. So how's the world responded to this call? We've um, pretty well in some of the, uh, in some of the countries that we would normally compare ourselves to. There's 7 billion euros in, that's been allocated in France, in France around 4.5 billion pounds in the UK, 2 billion euros in Germany, uh, 2 billion in Canada. And um, President-elect Biden has energy efficiency at the centre of his green recovery plan. And his, the plan is to create 1 million energy efficiency jobs. We'll see how he goes with the Senate in terms of how much is that's gonna, that is going to be implemented. Um, then at the... Uh, at the federal level, um, uh, if we look at Australia, for example, um, the, we haven't seen that echoed in, in an Australian context. There's opportunities for the, for the federal government to do a lot more, but we have seen a lot of activity at the state level. So um, uh, in New South Wales, South Australia, in Queensland, uh, collectively, so a bit over 200 million between those states invested, invested in public building upgrades. But then uh, what we've seen is that um, the Victorian government has taken this, this guidance to heart and made a massive investment in energy efficiency, nearly 800 million for upgrading the homes of vulnerable Victorians um, and another 200 billion for, for community groups and, and government building upgrades and, and businesses. And interestingly, if you dig into the Victorian investments that were announced um, over the last couple of weeks, there is a strong electrification agenda. Um, and maybe we can, we can dig into what that electrification piece means um, in the Q&A session in the context of energy efficiency and, and in Australia in particular, as we sort of grapple with what the energy transition looks like in different sectors of the economy. Put it all together, Australian, has, Australian invested somewhere in the vicinity of 1.2, 1.3 billion in energy efficiency, the bulk of that in Victoria. So can a big opportunity for Australian governments to uh, build on the momentum that's been created in Victoria in the next round of budgets and uh, really get behind energy efficiency to kickstart the economy and the upgrades that we know we're going to need to make on the demand side to work our way through the energy transition. Great. Thanks very much, Luke. And, uh, and uh, as you say, pointing out the, uh, the central pillar of the WIO, which is uh, energy efficiency.
Uh, so now we uh, will uh, have our final panellist uh, present, and that's Professor Stephen Wilson from the University of Queensland. Uh, and Stephen will talk a bit about the sort of big picture issues and technologies that we don't yet have. Over to you, Stephen. Thanks, Ken. Uh, and also thanks to Ian for an excellent presentation uh, up, up to all the usual standards, which I think is uh, remarkable in, in a year like we've just been through. Um, the slides that Ian shared with uh, Net Zero 2050 um, pathways on them um, were pretty daunting, I think, in the magnitude of the challenge that's in front of us. And, and I think even before we start to drill into the, the hard to decarbonise uh, emission sectors, um, but I think one of the really helpful things actually about the net zero discussion is that no one gets to put anything in the too hard basket anymore once we start talking about net zero. So we can't just kind of focus on the easy stuff or the, the first things that, that we naturally uh, look to. Um, eliminating or even, uh, even reducing CO2 emissions, it's a really difficult um, technical challenge for the cement industry uh, for the iron and steel industry and for others. Um, they're, they're big energy users, but it's not just about the energy. Um, so I think CO2 from iron and steel is on the order of about 7% of global emissions. Uh, and as, as Bill Gates says in this discussion, what, what's your plan for steel? So um, as Ken said, I'm, I've been asked to talk about um, how we develop transition technologies that we don't yet have, uh, such as green steel. So I think um, as we think about this um, and, and ideas like net zero emissions, it's worth keeping in mind that all decarbonisation strategies involve capital intensification. Um, so investing more capital than the thing that, that, that we're replacing. Um, but I don't think we should think about that just in terms of um, monetary dollar um, abstract terms because that capital gets manifest in physical assets including metals um, and and steel obviously is one big example of that um, it's energy intensive uh, it's emissions intensive and it's carbon intensive um, but it's actually a lot more complex than most other emissions and carbon intensive parts of the energy sector uh, so supplying the as most people will know, you know, supplying the iron ore for the steel industry has been the number one export contributor for Australia's economic prosperity for more than a decade now. And it contributes the lion's share of the profits in our two largest companies in Australia, or two of our largest companies, I should say, Rio Tinto and BHP, and, and with uh, FMG also now a pretty serious third player. So just a couple of numbers. Um, world crude steel production is now approaching 2 billion tonnes per annum. I think it was... Uh, 1.87 uh, in 2019 and just for perspective China accounts for over half of that so nine, 996 million tonnes or 53 percent last year in 2019 and of course iron and steel are, are very much at the heart of the Australia China story uh, on multiple levels so the, the thing that we're faced with here is that blast furnace technology um, is actually thousands of years old, the basic technology. And I think that tells us that it's actually quite hard to displace. Uh, and, and during the golden decade of the China boom, the Chinese steel industry achieved economies of scale, you know, um, uh, beyond anyone else so far, perhaps with a few exceptions, you know, with furnaces up to 5,000 cubic metres or larger. So they've built this very large fleet um, of this uh, technology. But having said that it's thousands of years old technology, of course, it keeps evolving and improving incrementally, which is the, it, one of the reasons it's hard to displace. So, for example, decades ago, um, you needed about 1,000 kilograms of reductant per tonne of hot metal, but now they've got that number down to about five, or I think under 500 kilograms. So there's this constant improvement going on. And the other thing I think to keep in mind um, with this uh, example, and you'll find this in the other hard to displace examples as well, is that carbon in the form of metallurgical coal in this instance is actually doing three really big jobs in the blast furnace. It's providing structural support, it's providing chemical reduction, and it's providing energy. So energy actually is not even secondary, it's, it's really the third priority in that equation. And it's the easiest thing to substitute. So the industry has been playing with substituting on the energy side for, for decades to try and, as part of their cost strategy, 
Um, and now they're starting to look at things like um, hydrogen injection. But it, this is really just a variant on those long-term trends. It's just a partial substitute at the margin. Um, and it doesn't really sort of address that question from Bill Gates. So in terms of, there are uh, alternative new iron and steel making technologies that are, um, that are, that are emerging, um, but just, just keep in mind that most of the alternate new technologies that have been tried in, in past decades uh, have either failed or they've been marginal technical successes, but um, hopelessly uneconomic. And there are sort of relatively few plants. So, um, and, and the challenge with the, the new wave of technologies is that they're trying to do something even more technically difficult, um, which is to completely decarbonize the value chain. So there is work underway on this, uh, including at UQ. Um, these technologies are currently experimental and they're at laboratory scale. If it all goes well, they might be ready for industrial scale deployment in probably about 25 years would be a sort of pretty conventional experience you know, industry person's view on that, I think. Um, technical experts have warned me that all the alternative technologies to date, and, and these, those were not trying to decarbonise the sector, they probably made the performance worse on the how much reductant you need per tonne of hot metal point of view. So just to wrap it up, um, when you start thinking about green steel and net zero by 2050, uh, I think you need to sort of keep these key points in mind. You've got a basic technology that's more than 2,000 years old that we're trying to displace. Half the global industry is in China. Uh, that industry is largely supplying domestic demand in China. Um, there's a large incumbent installed base of blast furnaces. Uh, serious companies have been looking at alternative technologies for decades and they've been largely unsuccessful. Um, and what we're trying to do now is even more technically challenging. So. I think it's fair to say that finding an answer for steel uh, in the sort of the answer to Bill Gates' simple question. And I think we will find similar things in other hard to decarbonize technologies and sectors, you know, like cement, for example, is going to require a very, very sustained multi-decade R&D effort. Um, and I think just, I think we will find that one of the arrows in the quiver will need to be CCS. Um, but my final sort of optimistic thought, um, since it was just mentioned that, you know, we've done amazingly uh, accelerated R&D development on vaccines this year. Um, I mean, vaccine development is a multi-billion dollar game, but the games that we're talking about here um, over the whole economy, net zero by 2050, that will be a multi-trillion dollar game. So that's my final thought. Thanks, Ken. Great. Uh, thank you, Stephen, for taking us a little bit up the fruit tree from the low hanging fruit of energy efficiency talked to about by Luke to the uh, and maybe the fruit out of reach in some of these other difficult to address sectors. Um, so now uh, I'll invite the panelists uh, back and I'll invite Ian back as well. And we'll move to uh, questions from the audience. Uh, so we've had a number uh, of questions uh, here and we'll try and get through all of them. But uh, as I said, if we don't, uh, we'll uh, try and answer them uh, by email afterwards. Uh, so first off the rank, um, a question about hydrogen. Uh, and I think this is a hydrogen vector question. Um, so I think this one's for Ian, building on what Kylie was saying. Uh, what role will a hydrogen vector play versus uh, HVDC interconnections in terms of uh, the scenarios that you're outlining in? Well, I think probably the short answer is we, you know, if we're serious about doing this, we need all of them. Um, hydrogen's, hydrogen's got obviously got uses in a whole collection of areas that are going to, that are very tough to decarbonize. Um, you know, in the case of steel, maybe we can use more electricity, electric arc furnaces. Certainly the Chinese want to do that but they're talking a 30 to 40 year time frame to do it. Um, but the short answer is we need everything. We need energy efficiency. We need dramatically um, increased production in, the, in our net zero um, scenario. Hydrogen has to increase by factors of 100 compared to now. Um, transmission investment has to double, including high voltage DC, including everything. Um, as I said, the, and the investment conditions for most of those things remain poor. So everything's got to be louder than everything else, as the 
as a rock and roll group used to say. Good, thanks, Ian. Uh, that question was from Chang Wang Wang. Uh, we now move to a, uh, a question from an anonymous attendee. Just noting the um, graphs that you had there for the UK, Ian. Uh, this person asks, uh, is, uh, is nuclear being uh, uh, regarded as a transition fuel as well as gas in the UK? Uh, nu nuclear is still there. Um, you'd be aware that the, the, the a new large-scale station, at least one, is being built in, in the United Kingdom um, as a share of, um, I think it declines slightly um, in terms of its share. So it's, it's definitely still there and it's seen um, certainly for the longer term. Um, but yeah, getting, getting new nuclear stations built in Europe uh, in the last uh, decade, decade and a half has, uh, hasn't been a happy experience um, for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, Olakuoto in uh, Finland and Flamanville has become, as French press called it, Koshmardesk. Um, it's a nightmare scenario. Um, we'll see how well the um, new sizable plant goes. Uh, interesting, of course, we've got a little bit of Chinese involvement, which does ra has raised a few interesting issues. Um, but yeah, the nuclear is there. Um, it's not a, it's not a growing share of energy, but it, it's still there. And it, look, it isn't a very important low carbon technology at a global level. You, you know, we, if we phase it out tomorrow, then uh, it puts a huge extra burden on other low carbon technologies. Okay. Uh We've now got a question uh, this time around steel. We've already had a bit of a discussion about steel and perhaps uh, Stephen might w like to weigh in on this one. Um, it's really about alternatives to steel. In other words, uh, from Chris Baker is a question, do you see any potential to de-steel rather than decarbonize the steel itself? Yeah, Ken, I think my short answer to this would be yes. Um, and I would see that as part of, it's like a sort of cousin of the energy efficiency story. And I think it's, um, you know, it is something that if, if you go into the data, you'll probably see that there, there, there are trends in improved efficiency of steel use over time. It's part of the, the big underlying trend of dematerialization, um, you know, light weighting, you know, car panel thicknesses today, for example, are much, they're much thinner than they would have been, you know, in my grandfather father's time and grandfather's time, so so that's happening. The the, the challenge is, and as as is the case right across the energy sector, is that the other factors are kind of more than cancelling that out at the moment. So the growth of global steel demand, driven by the urbanisation and the mobilisation and the industrialisation of China, has meant that the total has kept going up. Um, and of course, you know, to to get to the sort of um, long distant place where where you have a lot of uh, electric arc furnaces in China. That's the time when you're sort of into the the scrap wave in a really big way. But for for turning virgin iron into steel, um, which is sort of still the phase that China is very much in, and, and Africa has hardly begun to develop yet. Um, it's it's it uh, you know it's still going to be challenging. So it's kind of yes with an asterisk, I'd say. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Uh, the next question uh, is uh, addressing this uh, observation of, of Ian's that, uh, that solar is now becoming king. Uh, so this is from Graham Davis and it's probably a question in Nicola's domain, uh, which is uh, that uh, if uh, so much uh, solar is being generated in the middle of the day and the grid can't accept it, what's going to happen? Uh, and uh, maybe uh, we can talk a little bit about uh, you know, two-way flows and uh, and technology here, but uh, also maybe about policy. Nicola. Yeah, look, uh, thanks. And it, it's certainly something that we are um, quite concerned about, not just in, in the uh, case of, of having uh, not enough grid demand to, to be able to absorb it, but uh, more generally, even before you get to sort of negative grid demand, so to speak, uh, you know, we can see some challenges in the past that we're going to need to deal with. Look, we're looking at a number of things. Um, to your point, Ken, it's it's about uh, trying to find ways to be able to soak up that solar and, and use it another time. So energy storage obviously can play a really large role in doing that and, and uh, being able to make a better, more efficient use of that solar rather than just sort of wasting it. Uh, there's also uh, things operationally that we're looking at around standards and abilities to sort of control 
um, the PV in those rare situations where you might actually find you've got too much uh, solar on the system, being able to actually uh, dial it down um, or, or curtail the solar of, uh, in the homes under those rare situations is going to be something that we uh, see being necessary. In the same way that, um, you know, today, if we find that we don't have enough um, supply to meet demand on very extreme high demand periods, then, you know, you might need to shed load. You don't want to do it, but it's something that you might need to have as a last resort. So, you know, there are means and ways to be able to get more controllability of PV and, and the flip reverse of that where you actually don't have enough demand to be able to absorb all the solar and, and have to dial that down. So I think there's going to be uh, work on standards. I think there's going to be work on um, uh, you know, policy and encouraging things like energy storage and flexible loads and so forth to be able to actually accommodate those solar soaks. Okay, thank you for that uh, response, Nicola. Uh, we now have a question uh, for Kylie, which is not so much about uh, electrification, but about railwayification of transport. And the question is, uh, is there going to be an increased transport role for railways to move heavy goods as opposed to trucks? And that's uh, from Denise Fisher. Yeah, I, I guess I guess there, there could be an increased uh, role for, for rail transport. We, we would face the same structural uh, issues for, for rail that we've had over, over recent decades in that it's just uh, easier to, to use trucks and, and cheaper and, and especially of course while governments are, are subsidizing roads and while trucks don't pay for the damage um, that they they produce for their roads so it's, it's more or less like building the railway and saying to the railway company oh well you know you only have to supply the trains um, and you know the railway comes for free um, so this is what we're doing with the roads essentially and while ever we have that you know unequal playing Field, then I think um, the the emphasis will be on trucks. And while we have this existing industry for trucks, there will be a push towards developing either um, electrification for trucks, battery trucks, um, or, or hydrogen powered trucks. And there's a there's big move in both of those directions uh, at the moment. We don't know um, which will win. It, it depends on the development of the technologies. Um, but definitely, that's the way that things are moving at the moment. Yes, and I think this plays into this discussion around, uh, you know, the excise on fuel that uh, is uh, currently uh, at uh, the, the front of mind of various uh, agencies and uh, governments, uh, where they're going to lose income because people are transitioning away from, uh, from fossil fuels. Uh, and they argue quite wrongly that, uh, that this is what pays for the roads. It doesn't. It goes in consolidated revenue, and then you pay that from the roads. But anyway, um, so now they're looking at different schemes to... Uh, uh, to be able to, uh, you know, relate road usage and or road damage uh, to the actual vehicle that uh, that uses it or causes the damage, and uh, and this could may, you know, in some uh, uh, policy sense, uh, shift the discussion around, as you say, to the uh, the true cost of using the roads uh, in a way that may even uh, shift things to electrification because uh, the cost of uh, of the damage to the road from trucks becomes too much to bear for, for long distance transport. So it's an interesting discussion that's happening right now. Stephen wants to weigh in on this. Just a very small comment here. I think um, it's worth keeping in mind that it, this, that when um, businesses choose between trucks and rail, it's not only an energy choice and actually it's not only a, um, a cost choice. As I found, I, I used trucking as a simple example to teach the discounted cash flow model to some students. And in gathering up the data, I, I discovered that the uh, the cost of, of the per ton kilometre cost of rail is sort of roughly on the order of half the per ton, uh, ton kilometre cost of, of trucking. And so there's a, you know, there's other factors in the equation around logistics and speed and convenience and all sorts of things. Um, that are coming into play here. And I think as, as energy people, we need to just keep in mind that energy is not, it's not the only uh, part of the story. And even, and even the simple sort of cost metric is not the whole story. Maybe, maybe Ian um, has to deal with this stuff when dealing with scenarios, I don't know. Okay, no like to, you, Ian. all right. I'd just uh, like to add, add one more point on that and that thinking more more broadly about infrastructure we also have to think about um, you know the possibilities for railways now that a lot of us um, are changing where we want to live actually mm. 
um, and that a lot more people are going to want to live outside the, the major cities and those sorts of things can make um, railways also more attractive. So it's not only about freight. Agree, completely agree. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks everyone. A uh, question now uh, for Ian about the scenarios, and this comes from uh, Yoga Alvarez Romero. Uh, it's around uh, technological innovation, policy and behaviour change driving uh, the, um, the, the shifts that we're seeing. So to what extent are those elements uh, seen as drivers in the four alternative scenarios? And, uh, and, and with the idea that identifying the drivers of the scenarios as opposed to you know, the scenarios themselves uh, could give us key information about how to push towards the more desirable scenarios. Okay, I get all the easy questions. Um, <laughs> I guess a couple of things to say, we, we don't, in these scenarios assume major technical breakthroughs. We do model costs and, and you know, for example, we did model, um, in the case of, let's go back 10 years, we did model the fact that if the deployment of solar was accelerated, then we can anticipate cost dropping and, and that's come to pass as it happened. Um, in other cases, we've modeled um, the cost of hydrogen dropping and it hasn't come to pass. Um, I guess you are correct, though, in the sense that we identify particular behavioural issues um, where they give us um, some clues. Um, well, technology and behaviour, the SUV is a really good example. Um, but, you know, the fact that globally the, the, the whole passenger fleet is becoming heavier and larger because people have a preference for SUVs um, tells us something about, um, you know, about how difficult behavioural change can be. Um, you know, another example is the issue of plastics. You know, one of the biggest areas of all demand, the analysis shows is plastics and petrochemicals, which leads to the obvious conclusion, well, maybe one of the best ways is to cut down plastic use or to recycle plastics wherever possible. Um, you know, another, another really simple example is packaging and how much material goes into packaging. The EU some years ago decided that um, <clears throat> all packaging should be recyclable. So if you get a... Um, a fridge delivered in France, for example, um, the guys, every, everything's packed in either uh, cardboard, which is repulped, taken away and repulped, or aluminium banding around it. There's no polyurethane foam, there's no plastics there at all. Um, I just had a washing machine delivered this week, this week, covered in plastic, covered in polyurethane foam, um, you know, covered in steel, which none of which gets recycled. So all of those insights inform potential policy changes. Um, uh, and that's basically the idea of doing them. The whole idea of these projections is not to predict the future, it's to, is to change policy. Great. Great, thank you, Ian. Uh, so we have another question here. This is about uh, residential heating from Zain Elakluk. Uh, so Zain asks, uh, for residential heating, is there a clear choice between electrification and replacing natural gas with hydrogen? And I think this is a question the ACT government is asking itself very closely at the moment. Yeah, look, you know, again, it's a really good question and, and not just hydrogen, of course, biomethane as well. And I mean, one of the one of the policy options which we were knocking around with the ACT government was some sort of um, renewable gas obligation, a bit like a renewable electricity obligation um, where biogas could be produced not just in the ACT but all over the you know the vast plains of Australia and fed into the grid and obviously anywhere that's close to the grid um, can produce biogas that's an established technology the costs again could certainly come down if deployment was to go up and again I come back to that point about deployment if there is widespread deployment of a technology you can definitely expect costs to drop and governments have a key role in doing that so the actions that governments take let's say Europe um, Europeans are certainly very interested in biogas. Uh, okay, they may have a slight agricultural agenda here, but fine. Um, you know, widespread adoption and can certainly drive down costs. Look, the Danes, um, Danes had this issue. They actually had a, a pollution problem with large amounts of, um, to be blunt, animal waste associated with their intensive um, raising of pigs. And that, you know, led to a biogas agenda, which has proved very successful in terms of meeting their very high flexibility demands for, for winter heating. So governments can certainly drive that agenda. Um, the winner is by no means clear. But we do have a very large investment in gas infrastructure. Um, and you know, if we're looking again as a transition 
um, taking that gas um, away from methane you know, is obviously one important way of doing it. Maybe it's just, maybe it'll work out more economic, but there are, there are policy approaches which can drive any one of those solutions in, in different directions. Certainly hydrogen has got to be pretty high on the agenda, but how quickly we can drive down hydrogen costs, that's, that's the trick. Luke, did you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, look, this is something which um, there's a huge amount of conversation around in an Australian context, particularly in the, in the building space. And if you talk to most property developers, whether they're de developing commercial or, or resi, they're already just going or pushing towards all electric because the technology is available now. And they've the uh, the Australian property sector is, um, is is leading the world in many respects in terms of adopting quite aggressive net zero targets. So from their perspective, if you talk, talk to some of those groups they don't have time to wait for the hydrogen story to play out they're um they they say well look we've got you know heat pumps and the like that we can roll out um we just need to for our sector we just need to um get at, get on with it i think when with hydrogen um i think the conversation around hydrogen in australia um you know not 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 casting nasturtiums at the people on this call who I'm sure are very well uh, uh, well informed but the you know the general political debate around hydrogen is isn't very nuanced in terms of its role in different sectors of the economy um, uh, there's been a really interesting piece a couple two really interesting pieces of work on on this point um, over the, uh, in 2020 the first was commissioned by the California Energy Commission who who um, commissioned e3 uh, E3 Economics and Research to do a report on different scenarios for decarbonising the, the gas grid in California. Um, they've, of course, got very aggressive um, uh, targets around, around uh, net zero and, and renewable penetration and the like. And the clear guidance from that was, well, um, you, we just, we, the California needs to get on with the... Um, with the electri electrifying the buildings sector as much as anything else because they need the the renewable gas which is how the umbrella term for hydrogen and, and biomethane and the, and the like they need it in other sectors of the economy um, and you know there's an opportunity cost from um, not banking those carbon savings as the grid decarbonizes um, noting that we want to keep cumulative is emissions as low as possible the other piece of research I'd point people to that are interested in this topic is obviously um, the report uh, authored by um, Tony Wood and, and Guy Dundas for the Grattan Institute. Uh, it was released a couple of weeks ago and sort of set the hairs running, um, but fascinating read and very uh, uh, some provocative um, uh, thinking, but I think pretty well-founded thinking if you if you take the time to look through it in, in terms of, you know, what the implications are um, of, uh, you know, our, our aspirations around climate for the role of gas in the Australian energy system um I, I think it's been characterized as anti-gas i don't think it is anti-gas i think it's just realistic about the role of gas in, in different parts of the economy and interestingly in terms of that heating load they they sort of, they, they took a look at you know the the additional load if you pursued an electrification agenda in different states of states of australia and it was pretty much a wash um uh, in every state except for Victoria, and in Victoria they saw that well, you you might you might end up needing to spend uh, around forty percent more on electric on uh, grid infrastructure between now and uh, twenty fifty. Um, uh, if you electrify all that all that heating load that's currently covered off by gas, however, they didn't account for energy efficiency, and they didn't account for. Um, you know the, the flexibility opportunities that electrification opens up. Um, noting, of course, that you know as as new air conditioners and and pool pumps and the like get get rolled out, there's a, there's a clear agenda in Australia for making sure they're all dread enabled. Um, so you can actually you can actually have, which I think um, uh, Nicola was pointing to, you can actually start to solve some of those issues um, around you know ex excess solar generation in certain parts of the day at the same time as um, you know making sure that you're not you you're using any, you're using energy at the times of day without gen generating peaks. So a lot to unpack there. Really fascinating stuff. But the thing I'd say is that there's these there's these tracks of conversation around hydrogen electrification hydrogen and gas um they, they're kind of treated in australia as if they're they're different stories they're actually the same story and we need to start thinking in an integrated way about how, how all those things are going to play off each other and, and governments at some point in i would argue not too distant future are going to make, have to make some choices about what those decarbonisation pathways are in different sectors of the economy yes and i think the other argument that's uh, playing out uh, it, it relates to this uh, you know uh, property developers uh, question about, you know, 
timeliness. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it's uh, certainly the case in a lot of jurisdictions, they're thinking about whether they mothball the gas network when finally gas gets phased out and then maybe at some point hydrogen comes online, you've then got still the infrastructures are sitting there to tap into. Uh, and then of course, there's a the question of new suburbs. Do you even bother putting in a gas network for new suburbs? So these are all live issues. Indeed, and that's uh, that's one of the more provocative recommendations that Tony and, and Guy make, which is that there should just be a moratorium on new connections to new suburbs, because you're effectively you're you're effectively um, uh, creating connections that we could regard as legacy infrastructure within just you know a few years. Indeed. Uh, okay, uh, another question that uh, maybe we could throw up to the panel: uh, What is the panelists' view on taxing EVs in Australia? Who'd like to take that up? No I'm happy, to, I'm happy to have a go. <laughs> I'm happy to have a go. Um, so, I I think that it's a it's a the, the reaction of the and this is not it. This is not my constituency. I'm I'm an interested citizen, and I suppose interested in the role of EVs in the broader energy transition. I think there is a um, the, the, the folk that are rightly passionate about the, the, the role of electrification in that part of the transport sector and I think there's a huge opportunity there are already feel like they're kind of starting from behind the eight ball because of the lack of government support relative to some of our peers around the world. Um, uh, the point that's been made when you start to raise some, some countries around the world that have these types of charges in place is like, well, yes, they do, but they've also been, you know, aggressively supporting our industry for, you know, 10 or 15 years or whatever it is. Um, and so I feel like, I, I feel like, uh, you know, um, and the EV sector already feels like it's sort of, you know, there's, there's plenty of Australian politicians that are quite happy to give them a kick on the way past. And now here's, here's the latest injustice. Um, but what I would say is that these type of charges are not crazy. Like it's, and, and there's an argument that you want to put them in place earlier rather than later when you don't have a, a large constituency of people that are going to be crying foul um, when, when the EV sector inevitably inevitably expands. And I think if you, if you chatted to some folk over a beer rather than trying to engage with them on Twitter, they'd probably admit that this is part of the trajectory over time. Um, it, it's kind of about timing for me. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe there's an argument given the lack of support um, more broadly that maybe it's coming a little bit early, but I don't think there's, I don't think there's any fundament, anything fundamentally unjust about them um, in and of themselves. Good. Stephen? Yeah, I'll just, I just want to say briefly, I think what this is really about is how do we price things and, and uh, you know, what are our models? Um, because it, it, it's definitely the case that if, if we get to a world where there's no internal combustion engine vehicles and all EVs, then governments will probably feel like they've got a bit of a revenue problem. Um, and so I think it's really, it's really a question around things like road pricing and how do we price things and you know what you know what should be privatized what should be socialized you know i think i think having a, a very sort of pointy narrowly focused debate about tax is maybe not the place to start i think we should step back take a deep breath and have a bigger conversation because these kind of conversations are the sort of things we're going to have to have about how do we price electricity and lots of other things um between now and 2050 probably between now and 2030 even I'm happy to jump in as well there. I mean, to pick up Luke's point, um, where we've seen this sort of charging internationally, of course, we have seen very significant government policy support over literally decades now um, in terms of fuel use of charge, fuel, um, fuel efficiency standards, which effectively allow cross subsidisation between heavier and more profitable vehicles and more economical and deep zero carbon vehicles is one way it's been done. Uh, straight out cash grants, um, subsidies for the networks, all of those things that happen internationally, uh, and none of those things have happened here. So you might argue that. But secondly, I mean, excise, um, excise, it's a big number when you look at the dollars, it's around about 4% of federal revenue from memory. Um, you know, it's not the end of the world. If we had a proper road user charging system, we certainly had some sort of ton kilometre uh, component to it, then I'd feel quite a bit happier about it because one, it would encourage people to, to drive less too, it would um, charge people who actually do cause the damage being heavier cars or whatever, and that includes SUVs, not just trucks. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a fair bit to go in terms of the way we um, charge, the way we charge for road use and the way we raise revenue in general. 
I do have quite a lot of confidence the governments will find a way to raise revenue though. <laughs> 36 years of Ian, Ian, do you support the suggestion that we should tax tyres instead? Well, that, that's that's certainly one proxy. And I mean, you know, you, taxes can be sim simple taxes are, are good ones and simple market reforms are good ones. Um, it's certainly, you know, that's one proxy of doing it because, of course, you'll still have electric vehicles still wear out tyres and they'll still wear out brake linings. They'll still cause that sort of pollution. But, um, you know, the, the externality value of electric vehicles in terms of their benefits to urban pollution uh, and noise, I think one of the, Again, one of the things with the pandemic, we've realised just how noisy and polluted our streets can be. And, you know, when the vehicle traffic stops, suddenly, you know, the sky is blue and it's so much more quieter. So the electric vehicle value proposition um, at a societal level is very strong. And, you know, I don't think we're really recognising that, certainly not in Australia, but, but even internationally. But yeah, it's, you know, simple, simple taxes are good. Um, you know, it's, it's one proxy, not a perfect one, but you know, proxies, are, proxies are good. Yeah, maybe what we'll see is uh, B double trucks with uh, single big fat tyres on the back just to get around that. <laughs> yeah, I'd... maybe we should be taxing rubber instead. Well, yeah, rubber. It's the price, right? Yeah, yeah. Indeed, indeed, absolutely. Yeah. Well, on that uh, on that uh, uh, slightly um, uh, humorous note, we'll uh, we'll finish up the discussion and uh, thank uh, again uh, our panelists. Uh, Nicola Falcon, Kylie Cashbowl, Luke Menzel, and Stephen Wilson, and of course our presenter. Uh, Ian Cronshaw, who has uh, returned many times uh, to tell us about the WIO, and hopefully we'll be able to do that into the future. Um, we uh, recommend that uh, you check the uh, ANU Energy Change Institute website for uh, our future events, uh, including Energy Update again next year. Uh, we uh, will try and answer as many of your questions as possible uh, in the coming uh, day or so um, offline. Uh, and we uh, welcome you to join us for future events and uh, future discussions on energy topics more broadly. Uh, and thank you all for contributing.